Take your Bibles open to Luke chapter 4. I want to start by just reading the first two verses of this chapter. It says, And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into, or in the wilderness, being tempted. He ate nothing during those days, and when they were ended, he was hungry. So I want you to think for a moment, how many many types of signals do you think are going on around us at any given moment? Certainly, we know there are cellular signals, unless you have AT&T. Just had to throw that in. Of course, there's Wi-Fi signals, Bluetooth, radio signals, television signals, satellite signals. There's public and safety emergency signals. There's amateur ham radio signals. There's RFID signals. There's microwave signals. There's military and government encrypted signals. They exist all around us, but I would venture to say we rarely ever consider them. Probably only consider them when our cell phone's not working, or our Wi-Fi goes down, or our Bluetooth is not connected. Otherwise, we don't typically pay them a whole lot of attention. And while there's a reality that all those signals exist, there's also a reality that there is an unseen realm that exists all around us simultaneously. That unseen realm actually is stronger than the realm that you can see with your physical eyes, The realm exists in both a kingdom of light and a kingdom of darkness. And yet, so oftentimes we don't really give much consideration to that realm that exists all around us. A number of years ago, when uh, kids were in kids' camp, I've always uh, held to the policy when it comes to the local church that you do kids, you do time. And so I went to kids camp as a kids camp counselor, and it was there at kids camp during one of the services that, uh, uh, as was a custom, I would just kind of step back and just pray and say, Lord, who do you want me to go pray for? And there's one particular kid that we brought that was, a, you know, you could call him a bus kid or a van kid. We, we had a church van, and we'd pick kids up around the neighborhood, and uh, never met his parents, and he would come to church, but he actually, his parents signed him up to go to camp with us, and And every time there was the altar call, he would just sit back and watch everything that was taking place. And he never responded, never went up front. And uh, and one of the other counselors on the last night that we had service led him to the Lord. And I was not involved in that moment, and I, I was doing what I normally do, sitting back and saying, Lord, who do you want me to go pray for? And the Lord said something very interesting to me that night. He said, just watch that young man. And, and so I just was watching him, and the only way I can explain this, it, it wasn't a silhouette, it was stronger than a silhouette, but I saw a being that held a vase, and this being took this vase and would pour something out over this, this boy was eight or nine years old, and it would, the moment that vase would be poured out over his head, he literally would start to physically shake. I don't even know how long that took place. I don't even know really why the Lord, but he did. Because there is an unseen realm that at times, and at different levels, our eyes are opened to it. Last week we started this sermon series, it's called Vision Quest, and, and it really does have our, has about, it has to do with our, their ability to see things in the spirit realm. Am I telling you this morning that you're going to go and see angels everywhere? No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm using the, for me as an example, as, as something the Lord did to, to open my eyes to that realm and to that reality that is going on around us. But the moment we become followers of Jesus, we're given a spiritual sight. We see things differently. Because, because we've become alive in the Spirit, and the Spirit gives us in our inner person, our mind's eye, and the eyes of our heart, gives us this ability to see things. 
And so we're, last week we looked at this, this part of our sight where we, we understand that there's spiritual sight, but as part of that, there's insight that happens. There's foresight and oversight, and there's hindsight. Jesus, it was prophesied about him by Isaiah. He prophesied it about himself and then, and, and then proclaimed it about himself, and then he actually went and performed it. He said, the Spirit of the Lord has come upon me. And as part of what he said there is, the Spirit of the Lord has come upon me to give sight to the blind. So there's a natural part of that reality where he would heal those that were blind, but far more have been given the sight in the spiritual realm through Jesus Christ than ever in the natural realm. And so there is this, there's this dynamic of the natural sight that he heals, but he also heals our spiritual sight. Because you've got to get it out of your head. If you think that the idea of spiritual sight is just for the mystics or it's just for the prophets, it's for all that believe. The Lord wants you to see. He wants you to be able to see that there, there is more going on than meets the eye. Luke chapter 4 the devil is, is in, in this interaction with Jesus, is ultimately attempting to take away his sight. But what it does for us, it opens up for us an understanding and, and a realization of how the adversary, the devil, works when it comes to our lives. Jesus, Jesus never lost sight of his destiny, which was the cross. And here was a moment where the enemy was attempting to use his skill, use his ability to, to thwart, to, to, to make Jesus become blind through sin. Of course, as we move through this, you'll see Jesus overcomes every time. But for us, what it really does is it helps us see the pattern in which the enemy works. Our connect this morning is simply that our adversaries assaults aim to cloud our spiritual vision. Let me say that again for you. Our adversary's assaults aim to cloud our spiritual vision. The devil would like nothing more than to have a church, a, a, a body of believers, walking around like they have spiritual cataracts, where they're limited in their ability to see into things, to, to have a foresight of what God is doing. He would like to see us kind of grope around in life, just taking what life gives us. Because what the enemy fully understands is that when you see clearly, you're effective in every area of life. And so, kind of what we're going to explore today is really how do we, we manage this, this vision that the Lord has given us. Because the, the enemy has, uh, has a, an administrative process. Don't have time to go into all of it. I'll kind of give you maybe the 30,000 foot view. But the, the, the enemy is the god of this world. There, there, are, there are world rulers that we do not see that are active and working a plan. Not only that, there, there, are, there are regional rulers that, 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 that pour out lies and, and work in areas that, that keep people from walking in the clarity that the Lord would desire them to walk in. There are thrones, and by thrones, we're talking about seat of powers. Sometimes these seat of powers, they're, they're manifested in, in, in local governments, but more oftentimes, they're located in just smaller areas where the enemy has given authority to a power that says, this is how you work. It shows up and where there is an, over, an overwhelming amount of homelessness or, or drug addiction or prostitution. There's a throne that has been established there. And there's, there's a rulership. Back years ago when we were planting our church in Arizona, uh, where we planted our church, the, the, there were, um, oh, I think it was 52% of the people that lived in our area were Mormons. And let me tell you something. Mormons are not Christians. Let me say that again. If you're watching online, you've got to get this. Mormons are not Christians. They've rebranded themselves to try to make people believe they are Christian. They're not Christians. And, and, and so in, in, this, in this dynamic, because of the amount of uh, Mormons that lived in our area, 
uh, the, uh, the, the head 40 up in, in Salt Lake decided that they were going to build a temple. Now, there's Mormon wards where they kind of meet for church, but all the ceremonies are done in the temple. And so they built a temple, and I had a couple of the people in our church. Our church was brand new. They said, we need to go pray over that thing. They're, they'll let us walk through. And I said, oh, no, we're not. No, no, no. We're not ready to take on that kind of a throne. Because if you think that you can go and just kick that king of that, think that nothing's going to happen, you're kidding yourself. Because there is a demonic presence that is strong that moves the Mormon religion. There are, scripture tells us there are lords and rulers. There's, they're, they're making sure that the underlings, the ones who are affecting everybody else's life, are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Nothing in the realm of darkness, by the way, is, is done because of uh, incredible organization where they've all bought into a vision. It's all done by fear. And in the, in the realm of darkness, the, the demonic realm, they do what they do because they are afraid. There are authorities that, that are given control or permission. Uh, when, when, you, when you come to Jesus and you, and, you, and you begin to grow in him, you find that there are areas where the devil has said, you know, I'll let you go be a Christian, but I'm going to make sure that this door remains wide open so I have access. And so there's part of a discipleship process where you've got to learn to shut those doors and not allow the enemy in because, because there is that dynamic. And then, of course, there are evil spirits or demon powers. And here's the reality. This exists whether you believe it or not. As much as there are all these signals that I started off with, this realm exists. And this realm exists ultimately to make a mockery of the Most High God. And in a more uh, day-to-day reality for us, this realm exists to cloud our vision, to keep us from walking with a spiritual clarity that helps us to not just walk in our destiny, but to live out the identity of Jesus Christ on a daily basis. So let's break this down a little bit in... Luke chapter 4, because what you find, there are three areas that the enemy comes after Jesus in this place of temptation. And the first one is simply, he's saying to Jesus, you need to feed yourself. Scripture says it this way, the devil said to him, verse 3, if you're the son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. What was the devil trying to do here? He was trying to get, now watch this, he's trying to get Jesus to do a miracle for his own comfort. Uh, Jesus had fasted for 40 days. He was hungry. So his attempt was to get Jesus to use his powers for his physical needs. This is the place where the enemy works overtime in the realm of believers. Because we are all faced at some point with some immediate need. The immediate need for Jesus is he was hungry. But he wanted Jesus to access the Almighty God for his own fleshly needs. Because the immediate always makes us think of the physical over the eternal. Now, Jesus never lost sight of his destiny and his identity. Our identity was messed up in sin. And our, and our destiny for being a child of God and part of the family of God and, and everything that God has in store for us, all of that was, was, was done away with with sin. But then sight starts to come back. And, and listen, the devil does not want you walking. He doesn't want you to fulfill the destiny that God placed you for here now in his kingdom. He doesn't want you to, to accomplish that. He wants to divert you. But here, you got to understand this about God. The Spirit led Jesus here. And the Spirit will lead you into... 
And I think I need a new mic. This just keeps going in and out, driving me nuts. I assume it's driving somebody else nuts. They say we have problems with mics in church because we have a snake. But let me say that part again, though. The, the, the Spirit will lead you into places your flesh does not want to go. And you're going to be confronted at some point, if you've not already been confronted, with this temptation to satisfy the flesh. Because the lie of the enemy is this. And it's one of my, in my conversations with my American black friends, let me make a distinction here, with my American black friends, they've bought into the lie so many that believe that because they are saved, they, are saved, they can indulge in the things of the flesh. Now, I'm not going to get into an argument where they're going to heaven and hell, but what I know undoubtedly is they've believed a lie of the enemy and their vision has been clouded and their identity and their destiny is not being found. Paul said, he said in Galatians 5, he goes, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sin, sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, social, uh, uh, so sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. You see, yielding, yielding to this feed yourself mentality, this temptation that comes, it ultimately clouds your spiritual vision. Devil goes on with Jesus and he kind of moves into a very interesting one. He says, he, this, and I'm summarizing it, these two words, he says, worship me. Scripture says, and the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. And in a moment of time, he said to him, to you, I will give all this authority and their glory. For it has been given to me and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. So in this, in this place that, he, that the enemy comes to Jesus, Satan is offering him power in exchange for worship. Satan is saying, listen, I'll give it to you. Just follow and do it my way. Do you know what's not here? Jesus never, ever in this scripture argues against Satan's ability to do that. I want you to let that sink in for a minute. See, Jesus' destiny was not that he would be under Satan, but ultimately that he would be kings and ruler of the kingdoms of this world. Now, Satan's the God of this world. And he's been given through our sin. Don't just, I, I worked with a lady that she would said, when I get to heaven, I'm going to slap Eve. One of the more dumb things people say. But if it wasn't Eve, it was somebody else. And the, and the fact is, is we give him that. When we sinned, But there's a subtle trap here that we've got to be careful of. Because he's basically saying to Jesus, I have the ability to make good things happen. I can do this for you. What would Jesus have had to have done? In that moment, and this is where it starts really getting to in our lives, in that moment, Jesus would have had to compromise. He would have had to have compromised what he had come to do. Say that word compromise. Now, I know none of you compromise about anything. But we live in a world that constantly tries to get us to compromise something for something better. And compromised is fueled by ambition. 
I was, uh, kids, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not against people going to concerts. Uh, I went to concerts before I came to Jesus, and it ruined my ears. And so I, you know, I'm not a concert goer anymore, but if a person wants to go to a concert. But if you actually watch, not just a, not just a um, worldly concert, I, this happens in Christian concerts. You see one, two, three, four, five, six, whatever the band members are on the stage. But watch the crowd. Those people have been given power, and it's not because they wrote the right song. I want you to get this. Power in our world, even power that is used for good, doesn't always come from the Almighty God. But somewhere along the line, someone, because of their ambition, compromised. They said the things that they would normally, the standards they would normally live by, the behaviors that they would not normally do, just this once, they compromised because of the greater good. The loyalty in a relationship, the faithfulness to God, there was compromise. There was a a decision that was made that, that something would be better. I think that the thing that Bill brought in our ministry and mission People are too busy. They only have so much time. And so what they will give in furthering the kingdom of God is very limited. And that is not measured just by going to church. That's not measured just by going to church. Now, this, this is important that we get this because we, these are decisions we have to make. Y- years ago, our youngest son was pretty good at soccer. And um, our, our county manager, Christian guy, actually was very instrumental in the county giving us a building. Uh, a few years later came and said, hey, we want your son to be on the traveling soccer team. And I said, absolutely not. For two reasons. The biggest reason was, when does the traveling team travel? The weekends. And, and I wanted our children, Chris and I both did, it wasn't a rich alone decision here, but we wanted our children to, to, to see parents that would not compromise what they give to the Lord in any part of life. We are loyal to him and him alone first and foremost. Second thing, he was never going to be a professional soccer player. Listen. I hate to burst some of your parents' bubbles, whether you're in this room or online. Your kid's not going to be a professional. And if your ambition is such, you will compromise the things of God. And here's the scary thing. In our, in our, in our godless Christian society, you will see success and you will attribute to God, but the devil is blinding you. And you don't have to go and say, I'm going to bow down to the devil. Because just like there are Christians who will go to an idol of Mary, the devil has plenty of idols for everybody else. He's got money. He's got, he's got sports. He's got golf. And if Jesus told me to get golf up, I would argue. But I want to keep my identity and my destiny in clear focus, so that I might fulfill that which God has called me to fulfill. The last thing that he kind of hits him with is this, this prove yourself. It says that he took him to Jerusalem and set him on, a, on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands, they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, it is said, you shall not put the Lord, your God, to the test. So here, Satan, he's 
he's orchestrating, orchestrating a dazzling performance for Jesus to prove that he's the Messiah. And listen, if Jesus would have jumped off that temple and floated down, people would have went, wow, you're the guy. Because it's no different today. People are just looking for someone else to go, you're the guy. You're the gal, whatever. Because the devil is always trying to work this form of sensationalism. When I was growing up, we didn't, we didn't have thoughts of becoming famous. But we live in a society that the majority of those who are under 30 years old believe that fame is within their grasp. Because of all of the media has been able to do it. Somewhere along the line, the devil comes along and goes, you got to prove it. Certainly in the church world, we like that, right? We like it when the emotions get stirred up, people are feeling good. Boy, pastor, that was a good word today. I agreed with everything you said. You know never to say that to me. Because I walk away and don't agree with everything I say. And that's fine, because here's what, I, what I've learned with people like that, is ultimately what they're saying is, is that you were sensational today. I don't need to be sensational. I went along in my Christian walk, I was a I was, um, sales manager for a company, and man, when you reach authority, they come and get you when the bathroom gets locked, just to have you know. And the bathroom door was locked. And they said... I don't know if someone's in there, but you gotta, you got to get it open. So I, I went and opened the bathroom, and I, as I opened the door, our top salesman had fell off the toilet onto the floor dead. And do you know, it was at that moment that I heard the voice of the devil louder than I've ever heard the devil. Because I fully believe that God raises the dead. I prayed all night for my friend's wife to be raised from the dead. I believe it wholeheartedly. I'd never seen it, but I believe it. The devil goes, if you're a Christian, raise him from the dead. In that moment... All the other thoughts and emotions running through my mind, the devil's voice was the loudest. Because in that moment, he saw an opportunity to go, prove it, buddy. Prove it. Let me mess with your identity and your destiny. Prove it. And so when it comes to the whole sensationalism, I love it when God does miracles. I would like God to do miracles every day. It's really cool. But I'm not living for that. I live for Jesus. And I, and I never want to get caught up in this place where the devil will come and start to affect my identity. You don't want to let the enemy come and affect your identity, saying you've got to prove anything. Jesus proved it. Jesus came and walked a sinless life. He overcame the devil in every one of these areas. But the moment we think we've got something to prove, our eyes start to get a little bit cloudy. Because sensationalism ultimately will cloud us to what God's ultimate purpose is. Do you know, I believe that some of the most, the, some of the most um, rewarded people in heaven will be people we'll have never heard about. Have never heard about. Because God's not looking for any one particular person in his kingdom to be famous other than Jesus. But because we live in a, in a sensational world, I, you know, Sue and they're in, they're in Korea for the next month, and, and I love the work that he does with our, our stuff in YouTube. Uh, we, you know, we had somebody has been coming to church because they found us, they lived in California, started doing some searches, found us in YouTube. And so when I go on YouTube, do you know what the first thing I look for when I go on YouTube? How many people have watched? And then I look for the negative uh, comments because then you're really reaching people if you're getting negative. You know what? You know anything that's good for? It's only good for the flesh. There is no eternal kingdom uh, purpose in that whatsoever. But we're all drawn to this place of sensationalism, so we've got to be careful there. So how do we deal with it? Let me give you three things. The worship team wants to come just and real quickly just walk through this because the, the Lord has done a wonderful thing for us. And first and foremost, he's given us his partner, the Holy Spirit. And so that, there's the relationship. There's the dynamic in which we grow. We, we go in the power and the might of the Holy Spirit, our partner. 
That means that, that the Holy Spirit is there developing in us, and you can go ahead and take that to the go piece if you would. The, that the, the Holy Spirit has helped developing that in us. So, so first and foremost, it's the fruit of the Spirit. God's saying, listen, you, you, don't, you don't need to worry about your tomorrow. Just worry about that character. Allow the Spirit to develop that in you. And once there's been that development on the inside, the Lord will say, now you're ready to have me move through you. And then you begin to see the gifts of the Spirit begin to manifest. But it has everything to do with our partner. He clears things up time and time and time for us. So Clarissa and I were driving back from Burles on Saturday morning. Uh, we were talking about just our life with our kids and the challenges that we have faced over the years. And, uh, and I just said, you know, it, the reality is every time, every time there's a problem, I don't even think we see it the same way that other people do because, because the Holy Spirit has reminded us that we've built, like that song, we've built our life on his love, and we're not going to be moved. The problems come, but his love, it anchors us. So I, I, don't have to, I don't have to worry about the immediate because the partner's there to guide me and direct me. I don't have to worry about getting into to worshiping the wrong thing because the Holy Spirit's there to convict me of that stuff. I, I don't have to worry about being sensational. He's sensational. He's the one that I'm promoting. He's the one that you're promoting. But I think the other part, and I've been mentioning this all along, it has everything to do with our place. And our place has everything to do with our identity. Growing in our identity is our identity in Christ. I, I, don't, I don't have to, to worry about immediate things because I'm a son of the most high God who's got everything. And so I just look to him. He's the answer. I don't have to, I don't have to be concerned about worshiping anything else because, listen, I'm part of the greatest family of ever. And so... My identity is in him. I, I'm a son. I'm a child. I don't have to be sensational. Listen, I've, some of you will know that because I've done this with you. If you don't hear the Lord pat you on the back and, can, and commend you when things are going good and right, I want to encourage you to start listening to the Lord there. He is a big fan of you. You're his child. He's for you. He's not against you. He wants you to... He wants you to succeed, and by succeed, here's the definition. He wants you to live in your identity, and he wants you to walk towards your destiny. And he doesn't want you diverted and, and destructed by the wiles and the works of the enemy. But the last one is our, our position, because I, I just love this. Paul talks about he, we, he, 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 was, he was raised from the dead, and he broke through the heavenlies, and he sits at the right hand of the Father. And do you know the Scripture says that we are seated there with him? When you understand that, that our view doesn't just have to be this, it's so much greater. We're seated with him. We get something that's much better than a 30,000 foot level. We get an eternal view. We get to see the things that are yet to come because we're seated with him. And when you begin to walk in this dynamic and, the, and your partner grows in this, uh, this, uh, this um, identity that we're called into and, and really ultimately the place that, that we are and the place that we're going, the enemy's stronghold and his ability to tempt and overcome begins to get weakened. And you don't fall into the same traps that you normally fall into. And what happens is you begin to see things much clearer. Because like you... We are all on this vision quest. And so, Lord, will you help us by your spirit to not fall prey to the, to the lies of the enemy. Father, we, we, uh, we know that we are frail. And we know that there are times where there are these immediate needs. And, and anybody that's in this room or watching online that is in immediate need, I pray, Lord, that you will protect them and help them to recognize that this is an opportunity for the enemy and that they would choose to, to just look to you and say, Lord, I will wait for you to come and bring the food. Whatever it is in the immediate need, I'll wait for you to bring that. And I submit to that. In fact, some of you need to say that to the Lord. I submit to that. You bring it, Lord. Lord, you know that we live in a world where there our homes, our lives, our, our checkbooks, our calendars, they're filled with idols. And I come against that in the name of Jesus Christ. 
Our entertainment is an idol. I come against that in the name of Jesus. Lord, we will worship you and you alone. Forgive us. Forgive us for setting up and allowing those little idols to be set up that, that hinder the vision that you have for each and every one of us. And Lord, I just speak to the, to the identity of each individual that we would say to our souls that we are yours, that we have nothing to prove, that Jesus proved it all. When the world talks down, when the world says that, there's a, that the intelligent people don't believe, whatever the lie is, we have nothing to prove. My Savior died for my sin, went into the grave, and rose again and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And while there may not be a moment, there is nothing to prove because every knee will eventually bow and every tongue confess that He is Lord. I have nothing to prove. And so I come against those lies of the enemy. And I just, I just in closing here, I just got one more area of prayer because I just, just feel it in my soul that there, there are some of you that you do have open doors. And the Holy Spirit's been talking to you about those open doors. And you need to make a choice before the Lord to close those. And when the devil comes a knock and you just got to ignore him. If he rings the, the ring doorbell, you know the picture on the other end, it's the devil. Just wanting access to your life. And whatever that door is... I don't need to spell it out. The Holy Spirit's already done it for you. You need to make a choice to keep that door closed. Because the Lord will lead you into areas that your flesh is not going to like. And you need to tell your flesh, I'm not opening that door any longer. And so, Lord, we make that commitment now in the name of Jesus. Everybody said? Amen.